So it's a real pleasure to welcome today uh, Stephen Mukey, who's who's written a, an original piece of uh, fictocritical multi-species ethnography to think about, um, you know, living with these these waves that are passing over us. Um, all sorts of interesting concepts are are in here. Everything from um, assemblages, agencement, um, to thinking about um, vulnerability, uh, a, as well as. Um, you know, visiting Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. And um, Stephen, usually every, every week I just kind of invite um, the author who's submitted something to, you know, talk about how the particular piece of writing on the table sits within um, other things you might be working on or things that you've thought about since, since writing. So maybe I'll just open it up to you initially to uh, have, have the first word. Okay, so this piece started um, early in the COVID uh, era when I was, I, I gave myself the task of imagining what it was like to have COVID. So that's now the ending of the piece where I'm imagining that I've caught the, I've, uh, I've caught the virus and um, I'm getting sick and sicker and sicker and, uh, and uh, the ending leaves it ambivalent as to whether I've actually died or not. And so then I work back from that uh, imaginative moment to something that's more uh, rooted in, uh, in the real. But then I'm conscious that the, the play of fiction, nonfiction, um, the really real and the imagined real is uh, actually real. That the way, we, the way we imagine things is perfectly real um, in the sense that um, it's... Uh, other people's toxic imaginations that have got us into this fix in the first place. So uh, in order to kind of justify that interplay between um, fiction, non-fiction, real and non-real, um, I've adopted this fictocritical kind of style and then brought to bear some of my, um, some of my uh, fellow travelers, Stengers, Kausig, um, who else? Um, well, Stengus doesn't get much of a look in, but um, but then I'm working through questions of uh, multiple realities. Um, I'm helped uh, by Taussig there, but also Bruno Latour. So um, this uh, piece um, also is a little bit of an essay on, on the importance of, um, of creativity, of having creative responses to these kinds of crises, these kinds of political crises. Um, if, the, you know, if, the, if the crisis itself is, is huge and, and kind of totally weird, then how, how well can, is a kind of boring social scientific language response how well is that going to deal with it? You know, a kind of mono real, uh, one level of reality. Um, let's boil this all down to its sociological determinants or something like that. How well is that going to work? It's not going to work. Um, so I'm trying, perhaps failing, to, uh, to introduce um, the imaginative and the vulnerable into, into this piece. Now, the funny ironic thing is I made it so vulnerable that the journal that asked me for it, Cultural Politics, has rejected it. They um, initially, they initially um, wanted a piece that I translated from uh, Bruno Latour. On um, it's the piece where he uh, he he sets up uh, what are the uh, what are we going to have to relinquish or um, or retain as we go into a post-COVID era, and it's a kind of quiz or uh, set of um, set of possibilities that it's an exercise that he sets out for readers. So I translated that and gave it an introduction. They're happy to have that. But the, um, the senior person on the editorial board said, um, um, I've got the text here. I'm not convinced by terms like fictocritical, even though I accept that they're probably necessary to explain what people are trying to do. Um, um, I found, it goes on later, I found Madame Magpie unappealing. 
and the associational logic that ties the various strands together. Okay, but not exactly compelling. The John Berger reference, this person says, came across to me as name dropping. It's just a bit too chatty. There isn't much driving the narrative. I think it's going for a kind of reflexive modesty, true, but I found it a little self-satisfied and exclusive. I refer to Mick Tausig as Mick. I mean, I, I should have called him by his full name, Michael. Regardless of how much fiction there is in here, it reads like a leisurely diary entry, laid back thoughts and reflections. Only at the end, after the bird has infected the narrator, did I get interested. So, yeah, I mean, you can see how it's not really the stuff for a journal of some uh, standing, like cultural politics. It's um, it's kind of out of their generic, um, generic uh, boundaries. Yeah, so I thought I'd share that response with you to um, uh, because um, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you do experiment a bit, you often get rejections, but maybe I don't necessarily experiment like this quite so much or quite take it over the edge as this one maybe maybe has, but um, that might be enough for me by way of an introduction. So I'd be interested to see what um, what you're thinking, um, what you're thinking, whether it's useful or, or not. Yeah, I, I for one really liked the the narrative approach, and you know, in, in contrast to some of the self-aggrandizing pandemic philosophy that emanated from the likes of you know Agamben and other other elderly folks in Europe, I I, I, I thought that the the tone um, was fitting. And um, having almost died once from from malaria, I, I also found your your kind of uh, concluding lines compelling. Like I, I was, you know, at a point kind of in a state where, just, you know, resting my eyes a little bit or it could have gone one way or the other, it seemed. And I, I feel like you kind of captured that. Um, but the, the, the idea of vulnerability really jumps out at me um, from this as, as something that's important. and you're talking not only about sort of corporeal vulnerability with the peck and the infection, but the vulnerability of a text and the vulnerability of, um, you know, constructs about reality to interruptions from, from the real. Um, so, so if you could just meditate a little bit more on, on vulnerability and, and, you know, is, is this something you're pulling out of tax Tausig or is this sort of a, a thing that you're in, introducing on, on your own here? Um, yeah, where am I getting vulnerability from? I'm pretty sure I didn't make it up well on my own. <laughs> um, but it, I guess it's something I've been thinking about for a while. But I'm glad actually that you mentioned the word uh, interruptions because um, this is a kind of ethnographic, um, ethnographic uh, field work, but also an ethnographic writing technique that I've been using in a new book called The Children's Country that um, I've just finished. And um, interruptions as method is, I think, uh, quite an interesting way to go. It's like um, only when a system, a smoothly running system is interrupted, do we start to figure out how it was supposed to work. Um, you could uh, you could give the examples like when an activist like Occupy Wall Street or something interrupts um, the usual runnings of uh, of the financial center. Do um, people start interrogating how is this working against us or for us or how is it working at all? Or even something as simple as um, as driving a car and um, and suddenly the car cuts out and you have to pull over and then you think, okay, I'll open up the hood. Now, is it gonna be electrics or fuel? And then you start playing around if you know anything about car motors and you're working with those systems, the electrical system or the fuel system and you're testing them. And then you look at your watch and you realize that 
the system is getting broader because you're supposed to pick up somebody at 3.30 and they're going to be waiting, might be your daughter waiting outside school or something, getting worried. So the longer the interruption goes on, the more the system extends. Um, and I think that's um, uh, the, the interruption reveals the vulnerability of systems. So I get that both from uh, Bruno Latour, who talks about hiatuses and jumps. Uh, the, in things in order to persist have to jump, make little imaginative leaps. And from Tausig, who talks about um, the nervous system, title of one of his books. So he was he was arguing against um, system and function in, in anthropology, and uh, and use the use the uh, trope of nervousness to uh, to work on that. And, and where do we find the Latour uh, hiatus and jumps? Where, uh, that's that's part of Latour that I don't know yet. Oh yeah, so you'll find that in um, in the uh, the big modes of existence book, the inquiry into the modes of existence. Mm -hmm. Nice. So when he talked about networks and how they work, he kind of he kind of realized that networks kind of all have uh, firm firmly connected connections. So the relationships sometimes must have breaks, um, and and he kind of I think he philosophized that in order for things to persist the way they are, they have to take risky little jumps, and they can't just. Um, and I, it's, I think he calls them mini transcendences. So maybe he's having it a bit both ways. He doesn't want the big, the big transcendences of, um, of the, uh, of the German philosophers, uh, the resolutions of whole systems, as in the dialectic. But he kind of aims for these mini ones. And uh, and maybe he joins joins forces with Stengers there. Um, with their ecologies of practices. Yeah, I mean, the, the pandemics revealed so many different kinds of vulnerabilities, not only in, in our bodies, but in, you know, industrial assemblages and food supply chains and medical, medical knowledge, scientific knowledge. Uh, so yeah, for me, that's, that's a key word going forward is, is vulnerability. And in relationship to attention, though, I think something that I find really interesting is um, is that working with that idea of attention, because I have the vulnerabilities, are they only there now or have they always been there? Like, yeah, I think you'll discover them if you if you pay attention. Um, yes. If you pay attention, kind of. Uh, I was going to say in the right way, but maybe in the wrong way. Yes, yes, yeah. I, I think um, I, I suppose I should um, contextualise my perspective a little bit. I'm a critical disability scholar, so so I try to unpack a lot of what normally negatively accretes on notions of impairment and sickness and and whatnot. So. Um, vulnerability often has a negative connotation and, and I don't know if moving forward that's going to be very useful for any of us to think of vulnerability in a negative way um, but maybe to embrace it as the safest way of relating to ourselves and to, to each other and by each other I don't mean human humans I mean cross species Stephen, can I just um, say that I just was just so joyful for me. I'm also somebody who um, talks to magpies, and um, but I don't name mine. I, I just call them generally Magalulu when I come out to talk with them and um, very regularly. Can I check with you that I'm not taking some things too literally? So, am I am I picking up? are too literal am i am i misunderstanding the metaphor of biting the hand that feeds you so i'm thinking in in your wonderful piece where um junior comes in and bites you and you bleed is there are there layers of meaning there that i'm placing there in terms of gaia and 
uh, the virus and maybe the human species needing to do what Junior did when Fatso didn't want to share his food and that was to sort of roll over on his back and play dead. Is, is Am I being a little bit too literal in terms of in terms of what you're doing with the magpies and are the magpies pedagogical, I suppose is my question. Uh, are, are, are they in your story? Are they there to try to share with us ways of living differently, perhaps better? I think uh, uh, your, uh, your reading is probably more um, sophisticated than my, um, the exposition of the story itself. Uh, Sorry, uh, I, um, I just needed a device for the uh, for the um, for the virus jump, and so while Junior didn't actually bite me, I had him peck me. I had him yeah. pecking me. Yeah, um, he pecked you when he broke broke your skin, though, didn't he? He pecked you when he caused yeah. caused damage. Um, that's okay. Maybe I have just overread. I, I, I just, I just, I mean, I, I, I work in, in a strange way. I think I worship magpies. I think, I think they're phenomenal creatures. And, and um, I would, I was just getting quite excited at the prospect that you were inserting them there as leaders, <laughs> as thought yeah. leaders, if you like. They're characters. They're, you know, it's, it's like, um, it's writing a story with an animal as a, as a fully fledged character. Fledged. Mm. There's a, there's a metaphor for you, fully fledged. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so they have to have characters and they have to have their own individual characters um, and they have to have agency. Um, and so while Junior is, Junior becomes the, uh, the agent that passes the virus, mm. um, it's, not a, uh, it's, not teaching, it's not teaching us a lesson, it's just something that happens um, as far as I was concerned. Um, That's okay. But uh, but then the other, of course, the other job that Junior does is is demonstrate uh, demonstrates the mastery, non mastery. Yes, yes. By, uh, because Fatso Fatso thinks he's mastered the situation, and that's that's much more important for me is um, is uh, is uh, is Tausig's lesson about um, how that kind of mastery is, uh, you know, the kind of dominating ideology kind of stuff that's that's so uh, that's so uh, disabling in so many ways yes so how does mastery connect with vulnerability in your thinking okay so and the master the master is never going to reveal any vulnerability and and will therefore maybe it does link up with your pedagogy because if you if you can't reveal any vulnerability you can't learn anything can you? Mm, no. you, always, you always already know. Mm. You know exactly what to do because you master the situation. You're mm. Trump-like. Mm. So in order to be in a position to learn, you have to say, well, um, there's a gap here. You know, I'm vulnerable in this respect. Um, mm. But the paradox of uh, the paradox of mastery and non-mastery is, is a paradox that has to be has to be occupied as paradox. It's not something you want to get out of. Mm. You just keep inhabiting it, I think. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, for, for other folks that are just joining, feel free to un unmute yourself or ask questions in the in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed this piece, Stephen. I mean, I just love your writing. I mean, and the thing is that so much of theory in there with such a light touch. I mean, how I dream of writing that way. But anyway, what I really liked was this whole idea about immersions in living ecologies, which you talked about. And I was thinking of, and how you, how, you mentioned that how knowledge enters to this door of distraction, which I thought, and this, this thing between attention and distraction. And I was thinking of that in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the story you told, as well as the virus. Uh, just uh, you come back to that story in the end where, where you said that something about, you know, all these toxic imaginations are going on and you're, you're writing something kind of different. And 
Yeah, so it's just a di- for, for COVID, it's a kind of a different immersion in the living ecology, isn't it? It's, it's kind of toxic, if you know what I mean. So I was thinking of what you said about toxic imaginations, and then I was talk- thinking about toxic ecologies, because we always think of immersion in living ecologies, we think about Aboriginal insights, which you mentioned so in that, that paragraph. And I'm and I'm I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know, just because I do that kind of work when we look at that intimacy, but this intimacy is kind of toxic. So I don't know, it's just that I'm just saying stuff. Maybe just listen to what you have to say to that. <laughs> the um uh, embracing the notion of ecologies of attention is um and uh, means that, uh, you know, it's a familiar kind of position in, uh, in anthropology, the, um, the ontological term, where, um, where one isn't going to foreclose on, on possible ways of being. And, uh, and so that was a way around the nature culture binary. So if you say these ontologies are multiple, that inserts you, inserts you uh, humans, in a um, in, in in an ecology rather than in a reality, um, and the, if you're if you're in, in a bunch of uh, that, that's why I had this started off with this um, multitasking at my desk, where one of the uh, one of the portals that I was opening was onto what we used to call nature, and that the magpies entered through that one, but I did I don't want to have that. Uh, distinction. So I immediately say that, the, um, that there are multiple portals and we don't know how many they're going to be. Now distraction is, um, is productive. Um, the, uh, we've, we, we might forget the, the, how precious it is to have, if you're a writer, a room of your own or um, all, of the, all of the props and things that make it possible for you to actually write in the first place. Um, these are these are these are, are kind of a precious and supportive uh, ecological set of ecological configurations. So um, um, the uh, yeah, so the uh, th- that joins up with the mastery theme that that the um, that the the merchants of attention in the psychological industries who want to have us concentrating harder and harder all the time. So we can be more productive. Have forgotten that um, that uh, that a different kind of productivity enters through the enters through the uh, portal of distraction, and it's necessary. So that might be some sort of response to you, Michelle. I think you're, you're doing some interesting work or did you want to jump in Rachel? I was just going to point to to Tom's posting about the magpies. I would like to hear a little bit more about the magpies just because I too love magpies. One of my close friends and colleagues is a bird specialist and they are quite special. Um, I would just like to hear more and go back to Tom's um, point. I think your last, Michelle, thank you for posing your last question because that answered um, something that I had rolling around about attention. So thanks for that last Bit, Stephen and Michelle. Um, is there are there any other experts more expert than me on magpies in the group? <laughs> Out there? No. No. So uh, what I know about them scientifically is that they can you hear me all right there? Yep. So what what I understand about magpies is that they uh, are specifically located in small perhaps one to two square kilometer areas and they run a patch uh, and they pair up usually for life. If one of them dies, uh, a partner will be quickly found for them on the sort of the magpie trail. So the warbling will go out to a patch where there's a young gray, as he strains, I know, a very gray looking magpie, very young, youthful one, which will then make its way up the same warbling pathway to locate where there's a, um, of the right gender, um, uh, an, an animal without a pairing. Uh, they do, there's evidence that they recognize faces uh, and 
they do, it does seem like they're famous, of course, in Australia being the, the most dangerous animal for most suburban Australians because they moved into those suburban environments quite because their food their food now is more intensely located in the say three kilometer area than it would have been in the past. Uh, but they're also known for in September dive bombing, and that's why you see everyone with the hats in Canberra, in particular with the the um, zip ties sticking out of them, so that when they dive bomb you, and they will take blood out of your head, um, they do attack you. Uh, that uh, that you can avoid doing it. The other way you can do it, and it does seem to work, is that you feed them. So because they will recognise a human face, and if they, you're giving them food, they probably won't attack you. That's all that I know about them. Um, perhaps others know a bit more. I thought found they were curious because, um, not curious, but they, I, I like all these global stories of magpies that um, bring objects. They, 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 they find found things and they make gifts of them to people that, that um, or their, net, their social networks. So there's this kind of interesting thing about uh, objects and, and creating these um, ties or connections or... Right. Um, yeah, because my nephews, we feed the ones on the back fence now. And yeah, they'll bring dump little bones in the yard and stuff like that. And it will leave chicken bones out for them and they'll take them away and stuff. So yeah, there's sort of a communication between them, between us and them. Yeah. Just kind of on the arts of noticing, um, uh, birds are falling out of the sky and mass die off in southwestern U.S. reports The Guardian. And uh, it, I, I think it's interesting to, to think about in, in this moment of uh, pandemic emergence in humans, just all the, all the other uh, sort of unknowns that, that are contributing to the unraveling of, of these multi-species worlds. So I think we're really attentive to uh, human health problems and, you know, quick to diagnose and identify and try to uh, devise a, a vaccine or a cure, even though, as, as you note in the piece, we're, we're still in this um, space where the future, you know, the techno-scientific, you know, solution is elusive. Um, but it's but it's even more of a mystery, that, you know, we, we were dealing with amphibian die-offs for a decade or two before it, it was localized and, and you know, a pathogenic chytrid and we still don't have a solution for dealing with this. Um, so, so just, you know, inviting you to reflect a little bit, Stephen, on um, the, the, the directionality, I guess, of, of uh, disease transfer and, and your story. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I haven't really thought about the directionality. I, I mean, I did, I did see it as coming, uh, jumping uh, from uh, animal to, to human. Um, and, uh, and I could have put more in, I guess, about the, um, about human agency creating the toxic environments that create the necessity for, uh, not the necessity, but the possibility for these jumps to occur in the first place, deforestation and, and, and greater in intimacy with um, so-called wild animals. So um, that issue is, uh, I guess, fell outside the scope of, of my little, um, my little uh, backyard story. Um, it's very much uh, focused on, on, a, uh, on a personal kind of uh, intimate ecological niche here. Um, yeah, I could have done some more, something more about multi-directionality, yeah. I'm also really interested with what you're doing with Anna Singh here with the arts of noticing and uh, uh, also this idea of, of the surprise. Um, nature is not just out there waiting to be discovered as is, it surprises by virtue of attention directed towards it. Due attention we apply is in the form of the arts, methods and know-how. Some of these are normative, others are in the process of being forgotten yet to be created across many fields and would, would just love to hear you know more thoughts about um this art of attention or art of art of being open to surprise yes yeah, so that is a um that's a kind of revision of um 
of the uh, the dominance of the cognitive and psychological disciplines in the understanding of what attention is in the first place. And uh, already Anna Singh opens that door with um, with Arts of Noticing and Yves Citon um, with his more uh, humanities-based, philosophically based um, ecologies of attention well, in your own work. Um, so uh, the, um, the ecological approach to attention might be best exemplified through what I've learned through um, Australian Aboriginal um, uh, modes of knowing, modes, modes of knowing country, like, um, and I think I mentioned something there about the finches who make an appearance, the, um, how a, um, an Aboriginal man or woman who's tracking in the desert and um, knows where to find water. And somebody who doesn't know, to, know how to attend to that environment the way they do, thinks it's miraculous that they know they found water just like that. But we, I say for myself, didn't know to observe the way a flock of finches was heading. And so um, uh, it's, not, um, it's not because somebody's eyes are sharper or they have a kind of um, specially attuned psychological capacity. It's just know-how that's passed on through practices of um, hanging out with people who know, who have that know-how. And um, you're not asking them a lot of questions, they just do it and you work out how to do it. Um, and it's, um, so it's intergenerational knowledge transfer embedded in, um, in knowledge of, uh, of environments that, um, you know, it's not brain, brain to reality stuff, it's, uh, it's uh, all sorts of senses operating in relation to that environment, um, including intuitions and hunches. Um, these people in uh, Central Australia talk a hell of a lot about, um, about uh, gut feelings, about uh, knowing things sort of kind of intuitively. And they all go from one group to another and they've all got words for this sense of gut feeling. I also wanted to open up um, what, what you're saying here towards the end about Lovelock and, and Gaia and, you know, Isabel Stingers has that, that piece about Gaia's revenge. And, you know, on the other hand, er, early in the pandemic, you saw uh, white nationalist groups uh, uh, do disinformation campaigns, co-opting some of the Extinction Rebellion's branding to say, you know, this, the, this Corona virus is, is a response to, um, you know the 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 problems that humanity has has you know foisted upon on the world, and I, I think one of the things going back to vulnerability we're seeing is unequal vulnerability. You know the the anthropos as a unified subject is is fracturing. It's um, not uh, doing sort of even even damage. Like you know if you look at the color of COVID in, in the U.S. in particular and and other places. Um, you see that it, it's um, cutting across lines marked by race and class. And um, how, how, how do you how do you kind of bring all these these things together? in, in the sense of, um, I mean, on the one hand, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have a, a very systems theory oriented kind of idea about homeostasis and regulation, and um, you know, people people like Lovelock and Bateson. Um, for decades have been talking about, um, you know, ways that, that this, this planetary um, informatic system might sort of try to readjust. Um, but, you know, hold, holding that together with the assemblage or um, uh, agencement as, as you gloss it here, um, yeah, systems have glitches, systems have surprises and um, so I guess maybe in part it's a question about homeostasis versus disruption, surprise, and emergence, um, and how to you know attribute functionality within these chaotic interlocking systems that we can only partially understand 
but I guess it's also a question of, um, yeah, maybe multi-species justice and, and sort of situated in um, worlds of relative privilege where, where some are getting sick and others aren't. Yeah, the, uh, the color of COVID is a good phrase. And uh, I do recognize that, that uh, I, did, um, I did sail too close to Lovelock's um, kind of uh, attitude about, well, you know, what do you expect when you've overpopulated the world with humans? It's, um, it's a bit too much of a blunt instrument that uh, flirts, flirts a bit too much with sort of eco-fascist positions of, <laughs> So uh, yeah, I was worried about that being in there. Um, and uh, had I more space, maybe I should rewrite it with and take that out and, and put in a whole section on something different, which would be, um, which would be about, uh, you mentioned the word situated in relation to multi-species justice, um, and, you know, which, uh, you know, it was Haraway, I think, who, who put situated knowledges on the map back in, 1988, um, and uh, and that was the kind of breakthrough that uh, that uh, made us realise how provincialised, um, masculinist or uh, Western scientific or however you want to characterise uh, those kinds of knowledges that had a will to universality, and uh, we kind of accepted, oh yeah, well this is good scientific knowledge and and it should proliferate. And I wouldn't, in a way, I wouldn't argue with that. Why impede the passage of good ideas? Let them spread around. And then I would add, as a kind of uh, final plank to that little argument, is that well, what about these indigenous knowledges that are getting a bit more traction? So that um, so that uh, uh, people in North America, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, um, indigenous people who stuck to their own country kept up their situated knowledges, now have this kind of opportunity of saying, well, we have a universalizing opportunity too. Uh, we can share our, our principles, if not the particular knowledges, at least the, the principles of, uh, you know, earth boundedness and uh, distributed authority and, uh, and uh, totemism as shared, uh, shared, multi-species ecological management. Deborah Bird Rose came up with that. Um, yeah, so that, that is universal, universalizable um, in a way and uh, is an antidote to, um, to the older masculinist, uh, modernist, Western science is gonna have all the solutions and take over the world um, attitude. I was going to jump in and, and I, I love the last thing that you um, were discussing, Stephen. And at the same time, I, um, I, I, I think there's this. You're right. There's this. There's this moment in which maybe some um, different ways of knowing are are getting uh, greater traction. And at the same time, you know, I'm reading around. You know, following uh, economic effects of. Uh, short term and long term, not just pandemic, because these are issues long before, but adjunctification and indigenous scholars um, struggling within that kind of economic uh, context. Um, but also it was, I, I think I was just reading about uh, Linda Tohiwai Smith recently about there, there was something circulating again about indigenous scholars being able to continue to do their work, for instance, um, and, and, carry, um, and, ca and carry that work forward in an academy that's being decimated. So I, I, I think what, your, um, what your, your last point was, was really lovely. Um, and, and at the same time, I see this tension that the pandemic you know, has, has, has furthered because I don't wanna say, this was, this was an issue long before, um, about at least academic representation, but also you know how that kind of gets uh, or, or um, um, is butting heads with the with a with a broader uh, labor reality um, in, in the academy. Um, my my question for 
for you was, you know, now that um, you, 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 when you were talking before about some of the uh, editorial feedback, and then you were mentioning, you know, things that you might tweak or, or, or theoretical framings. Um, but I'm just curious, uh, um, are you um, thinking a little bit more about tweaking? Um, were you um, thinking of carrying this forward in a, in a different publication venue? You know, do you see a different um, potential uh, location for this landing? Are you, we were saying earlier about, I'm not sure that it's completely ficto critical, or I'm not sure it fits exactly that. Um, where do you think you're taking this next? Well, um, I'll publish it, uh, you know, anywhere. We want, anybody wants to have it. <laughs> um, but uh, I'd, yeah, I'd like to see it. Since I went to the trouble of spending time on it, I'd like to see it out there. Um, and uh, but even this kind of discussion is is a good thing to do with it. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's never appears you know, in print, really, um, this kind of thing is, uh, is perfectly a uh, good thing to do, do with it. Um, you said the adjunctif adjunctification. Uh, could you explain that? Um, well, yeah. I'm just thinking about these sort of broader conversations about um, representation, uh, particularly for Indigenous scholars, uh, in, at least that I'm hearing and, and reading around. Uh, and some of those have to do with the collision of adjunctification of the workforces, but uh, they, they also have to do with, you know, co contractual differences, um, as well as um, broader, you know, profound and, and broader problems of representation of First Nations and Indigenous people uh, in, in higher ed. So on the one hand, there, we're, we're in this moment in which we are, you know, uh, I'm thinking now about the pushback that people are receiving or, or talking about in California and the, for instance, the wildfires and um, indigenous folks continually to write and, uh, and, and speak and talk about the knowledges that, were, that, that have been there um, for generations already and saying, oh, you mean that all this, you know, all these things that we've been talking about and writing about and doing for, for so long. Um, in fact, um, now people, you know, now, now are, are gaining traction, for instance, in this moment of profound, um, what did you call it, Eben? You said the, uh, sorry, <laughs> I've only had one coffee. It was the, the Anthropo says, uh, what did you say? You didn't use the word explode, but you, uh, uh, fracturing yeah. fracturing yeah. or yeah um I, it was something about this <laughs> that was making this kind of um and so um that's what i was referring to was just you know this there's this collision happening that is pre-pandemic of the of labor forces at least as i'm hearing and reading around and um um and this uh, already long-term issue of of representing indigenous um, peoples and indigenous work in, in the academy. And so that to me that there's this kind of collision of um, getting traction as you, uh, as you mentioned um, in, in certain ways, but then, but then also this kind of uh, uh, dissolution or um, Profound uncertainty on the on the on the labor front of uh, at least in the academy of being able to um, further represent that uh, that research and those um, those scholars in this moment and also pre pandemic. So that's what I was. Speaking yeah, so about. that's a, that's an opportunity. That sounds encouraging, and that's an, it's an opportunity you also see um, realized when. Uh, when, you, when we have a kind of emergent indigenous science or sciences um, where in Australia we have ranger groups. So ranger groups are funded uh, funded by uh, Commonwealth government to, to look after country in various ways. They might do simple things like weeding or looking after native species or whatever. And they might work in conjunction with, with uh, people trained in uh, in, uh, in university science. So you have a, that flowing together produces this hybrid knowledge where 
where there is um, the Indigenous collaborator is not treated any longer as an informant, but finds that they have their name also on the publication as an expert colleague. And then what, what's emerged is people doing science in a way that they haven't done it before. And you could call it Indigenous science or um, uh, or something else that doesn't, doesn't matter that much, but it produces reliable forms of knowledge. Um, it's kind of remarkable <laughs> in Australia where, where um, 60,000 years of um, occupation by humans has produced some really reliable forms of knowledge. But it's uh, only now where the rest of us are starting to acknowledge as, as science precisely because it's reliable knowledge that works. Yeah, I had the real privilege of spending so much of time with the land and sea rangers, but particularly the women rangers, Stephen, in the Northern Territory. So you have very few women ranger groups. So yeah, it's really mm, interesting experience. I was wondering, you know, kind of in contrast to those kinds of situated knowledges, you've, you've got a, a line in here from Tausig talking about the humans who thought they could profit from the latest domination of nature. And I think you see that in, in the food system, you see that in, you know, mul multiple species of biocapital to play with the phrase of, of Stefan Helmreich. Um, so, so maybe if you could un unravel that a little bit it, as, as you see it playing out in the world, what are, what are the what are the kinds of uh, profit schemes and dreams that are um, producing um, these mutations to um, the life-giving generative systems that, that we depend on? Evan, you know about 10 times more than I do about that. <laughs> so I think you should tell, you should tell us. Well, I, I, I have time to tell that other times. Yeah, no, you're, uh, I don't know. Oh, right, um, okay. Um, you might have, maybe you have been talking about that kind of thing in the course of your um, ongoing workshop. Um, but yes, yeah, so that kind of um, extractive, uh, inventive capitalism, inventive and cap inventive and extractive, extractive at the same time. Um, I can just think of a little. Um, a little Latourian line that may be helpful in that context is um, him arguing against um, against uh, uh, productivism. Um, you know how production was always part of the algebra of Marxist economics. You had production, consumption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it was production was just always there as a kind of given, and uh, and then and then capital and labour would argue about the distribution of the fruits of production. You know, who should get what, how much? Um, and Latour's argument was, hang on, um, we have to rethink production entirely because of the, because of planetary uh, limits and not say that our overriding relationship to the earth is a productive one. I mean, in a way it's kind of obvious. It's, it's, it's a sustainability argument, but um, but uh, I think it is useful as a kind of um, intervention in some of the commonplaces of um, of progressive economics. Thanks. That was that's really helpful. And and maybe also you know. Uh, so the, the quote from Singh on arts of noticing patterns of unintentional coordination develop in assemblages. Here, I think she means agencement and Deleuze and Guattari, natural, cultural, and multi-species assemblages that provoke and rather than signify. So, so what do we lose with our um, conventional glosses of assemblage? And you know, can, can you tell us more about agencement if I'm even approaching the right pronunciation and, and these What's the relationship between provocation and signification? I was going to ask you again if um, 
because it is a bit obscure what uh, that thing from the scene. Um, where is it? I'm looking for it on the text. Uh, Page three towards uh, middle paragraph. Yeah, so it is a little obscure what you're saying here. So I am interpreting it. And um, so, and I'm also dosing Agencement, um, which was in Thousand Plateaus, in um, using one of your phrases, <laughs> multi species. Um, so I'm pushing that in a, in a different direction from uh, uh, well, already Deleuze and Grotty are arguing against linear causality in uh, in in the way the, the way we construct arguments. You know, their you know how their philosophy wouldn't be a um, wouldn't be a cause and effect type of you know, series like linear set of arguments, but rather one that um, where um, uh, heterogeneous actors could join up and produce effects that would be um, unpredictable from the set of inputs. So they're trying to be realistic in a multiple, multiply realistic uh, kind of way. Um, uh, so uh, now the, the other question was uh, signification versus um, provocation. Uh, yeah, so um, if, if, if in these assemblages we have the uh, uh, heterogeneous um, uh, coming together, heter heterogeneous bunches of agents all doing their different things, then the um, then the effect there is not is not a reduction to the to the semiotic level, as in this the the, the product of this agencement is something that is there for us to interpret, because that would run against the um, precisely against the anthropocentrism we're trying to decenter. So meaning the semiotic in in the in this sort of post-human kind of domain we are starting to occupy, the semiotic sort of just dwindles into insignificance compared to the possible effects of other kinds of agency. Um, you know, it's like asking what it means to be human is already the wrong question um, because it's got the word mean, meaning there. Um, but rather, already with Deleuze and Guattari way back then, they were saying, "What is it that what is it that a body can do?" And that was their significant, significant. That was their provocative question. So, so we're almost at the witching hour. Does anyone have a, a final question, or, or Stephen, do you have any final thoughts? Um, I must, uh, I must download these uh, chat comments. I just press that little thing, right? And that will save it. Good, yeah, excellent. Uh, final comments. Well, thank you very much for having me uh, on your show. Uh, and uh, yeah. Sure, yeah. Welcome to the multi-species show. Come back. <laughs> okay, but sometimes it's at times of the night when, um, I should be sleeping, right? Do you, you vary the time slot, or is it always the same? Yeah, it's it, it it changes each week depending on where in the world the the featured author author is. So yeah, we'll we'll try to do some some more Australia friendly zone zoned times. But um, it's it's interesting to see it, this this is one of the smaller groups that we've had, and I, I think it, it's not the the writing. The writing is is beautiful and amazing, and um, definitely uh, it. I want it to be in print soon so I can refer to it. Um, but yeah, I think the time the time slot uh, that we had before, which was more kind of Europe, US friendly, tended to get a bigger, bigger turnout. But uh, this, this is great. It's, it's also lovely to have these intimate discussions. Okay, well, I'll see you back in Australia in November. See, see if, if, if the travel gods are willing. 
And Rachel, can you remind us who's who's on deck for next week? Is it Caitlin again? Uh, yes, uh, Caitlin Berrigan is going to be talking about drug pricing and a new piece. She's writing about drug pricing. Awesome. Great. Well, see, see you all uh, sooner or later. Thank you. Okay, okay. Again, bye. bye Good to see everybody. Bye. All right, should we